Welcome to an online Bible study from Harbor Sight Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. Go to Matthew 26. We're going to continue our study. We're looking at what others believe. I hope it's been a help to you. I hope it's been something that uh, you not only find of interest, but you also, um, if you happen to know people that are part of any of these groups that we've looked at, whether they're Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Hindu, um, Muslims, Catholics, now that we're looking at uh, Roman Catholicism, um, maybe it's something that since we have this information and we're going over it, maybe it'll just kind of tenderize your heart and cause you to pray a little bit more earnestly for them. Uh, that certainly is my goal. Uh, again, not to, not to just have uh, an academic exercise, of course, and, and um, find out what other groups believe just so we can, you know, whether it be pr say, you know, you're, you're wrong, we're right, that kind of thing, uh, but just simply to have compassion for them because um, they, they are in bondage. And we're, we're learning that. Now, just as a refresher, you remember we started <clears throat> last week looking at Roman Catholicism. And um, who's the founder of Roman Catholicism according to their church history? Jesus, Jesus is, okay. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we, we know that that's, that's not the case either. But who's the leader of the Roman Catholic Church? What do they call him? He's the Pope, okay? And um, who was the first Pope according to uh, their, their um, history of who, who started it and who was the first leader uh, of, of the, the first of the Roman Catholic Church? Peter, of course. And we looked at that last time. We looked at uh, those passages in Matthew 16 that they take and uh, really... Uh, they go ahead and they twist all of that, and I think it's something that I've noticed, and you probably have as well, as we continue looking at these different groups of, of um, other believers, if you want to call it that. They believe other things and uh, biblical um, principles and so forth. Um, they, they all... How should I put it? They, they, they all say, we're the first one. We're the most important one, um, and so forth. And um, it, it is definitely something that um, they believe. They also twist the scriptures, okay, uh, which is not uncommon. Um, Satan did the same thing back in Genesis chapter 6, or Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, as well, but I want to continue, and I want to look at their um, their doctrine of transubstantiation uh, this evening, and what that means, and what it is, and in uh, the passage of scripture that they use to pull out a, pull out a scripture and then twist uh, to to prove their point. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. We do ask your blessings upon our time, and we, we pray again, Lord, that you would give us compassion for those that are followers of the Roman Catholic Church, that are members of the Roman Catholic Church, that have been blinded by the principles that the Roman Catholic Church preaches. And, and Lord, we, we pray that you would just help us to lovingly not only pray for them, but when we come in contact with them and have the opportunity to discuss what they believe, that you would help us to just simply proclaim your word. That is the best thing for us to do. It's, it's not something that we, we shouldn't present it in such a way that, well, our church believes this or that, or our pastor, or, or, or uh, you know, our, our denomination, or something like that. We need to just present your word for what it is, because you've told us in your word that it is truth, and it is the one thing that they need to understand that they need to know and we pray that you would just uh, continue to help us to love them to pray for them uh, to present your word and um, just trust you lord to work in the hearts and lives of uh, those catholic people that we know that uh, their eyes might be opened 
and uh, they would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and, and, and leave the Catholic Church. We pray your blessings on our prayer time as well here in just a few moments that you would just work in every circumstance. We'll thank you in advance for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I mentioned to you <clears throat> that we're going to look at uh, their doctrine, their teaching of transubstantiation. Okay, that's a great big long word. Okay, and basically it just simply means a change of substance. Okay, it's a, that's, that's an easier for you to understand perhaps uh, than that great big word transubstantiation. But what they believe is that when the priest pronounces the word of consecration over those elements, the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper, okay, communion, um, <clears throat> they call it the Eucharist uh, as well, that when he holds that, that bread and holds that cup and he pronounces, you know, um, take eat, this is my body, just what Jesus said in Matthew 26 here, and we'll get there in just a second. When he says that, that, that wafer, and I should have brought what we use, a little piece of, you know, unleavened bread and so forth. I should have done that. I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, but that little wafer, that little uh, cube of unleavened bread, that wafer that they use and that kind of thing, when he says that, according to their doctrine, it becomes the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It becomes Christ, okay? And <clears throat> the wafer becomes Christ, uh, and, and part of their doctrine, I didn't know this until I was preparing for this evening, uh, they actually worship the wafer. They pray to, is that correct? They bow to? <clears throat> you you can't, can't touch it? Okay, okay. Uh, the, only the priest has it can right. contact that, right? His, his, his is hands. About, about like okay. Okay. I've I've seen some of that because there's a there's a channel on TV that you can actually watch different church <laughs> programs, and I think there's actually a a Catholic TV channel uh, that you can they they show their mass all the time and different stuff, and you can see, you can see that. Um, so. But um, also the priest, I didn't know this either, uh, the priest has the power to change the bread into, into Christ. Because, and according, according to their doctrine, Christ obeys the priest and comes into the bread. Okay? So that, that's pretty bold talk as far as I'm concerned, isn't it? Um, but that's, that's what they believe. And <clears throat> I want us to, to look at the passage, one of the passages of Scripture that they use, Matthew 26. Let's look at verse 26. This was the night he was betrayed. This is the Lord's Supper. This is, you know, um, communion, if that's what you want to call it as well. Um, but notice what it says here. It says in Matthew 26, 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, okay, here's the consecration part, okay? Take, eat, this is my body, all right? And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, Okay? They believe that what Jesus meant when he said this, he meant it literally, okay? Take, eat, this is my body, okay? Now, let me ask this question. Um, I want us to look at several passages of Scripture um, that, that kind of uh, counter this point, okay? Uh, how many of you have ever heard anybody say, well, as a matter of fact, there is a very well-known professional golfer who was given the nickname when he was a child by his father, and he has since changed his name legally to Tiger. Okay? 
We all know who Tiger Woods is, okay? When we think of a man being a tiger, that guy's a tiger, okay? What do we mean when we say that? Matter of fact, the... Air Commando Squadron that my father was part of, the 606 Air Commando Squadron, their motto was, every man a tiger, okay? What does that mean? Does that mean that they actually became tigers when they were, you know, they transformed themselves into tigers when they got into the airplane, which would be really weird because I don't think tigers can fly? (laughs) But what, what do they mean when they say that? Every man a tiger. What is that? It's, it's fierce, it's aggressive, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an illustration, right? It's kind of a mindset kind of thing. Um, the, we, have the, um, we have a Marine veteran here, and the Marine's um, mascot is a, a bulldog, okay? They call themselves devil dogs, okay? What does that mean? Does that mean when you finally make it through uh, your boot camp and you get your eagle globe and anchor that the, matter, the m- moment you pin that on, you are transubstantiated into a four-legged, large-headed, big-jowled, uh, fierce-toothed animal? Only when he's mad. Okay, <laughs> only when you're mad. Okay, <clears throat> okay. But off sometimes we use we use words figuratively, don't we? How many of you have ever known anybody that was bullheaded? It's a bullhead man. He's really bullheaded. What does that mean? Like, does that mean he looks like a minotaur? He's a body of a man and a head of a bull. That's what we're talking about. No, we understand from that's a figurative. Okay, hold your finger in Matthew twenty six, and I want you to turn to John chapter one. We'll look at some verses here that use this principle of of illustrative and descriptive terminology, okay? Notice John 1, verse 29. John says, when he sees Jesus, says John, in John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the what? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When he pointed to that person coming into the Jordan River to be baptized by him, he pointed at his cousin, Jesus, but what did he say? He's the Lamb of God. Okay, was Jesus transformed automatically into an actual lamb, or is it figurative? He's calling him a lamb. Okay, what's the purpose behind that? Why is he saying, why is he using that terminology? Why does he call him the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? What would the Jewish hearers that were there, what would they understand that phrase to mean? He's a sacrifice, okay? Let's look a little further. Verse 36, John chapter 1. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. There's that idea. Okay? Let's go a little further in John's gospel. Hold your finger in Matthew 26. Let's turn to um, John 7. John chapter 7. Look at verse 37. John 7, 37 says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, what does he mean? Does he mean that when the disciples came to Jesus, they, you know, and there was some implication there, if you come to Christ, you you, you own him as your Savior and so forth, that all of a sudden your belly is going to open up and water is going to come out of it. Is that what he's saying? What is he meaning? He means something different than, and, and people understood that, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, Christians ought to be the kind of people who have this 
And there's other, you know, other implied information here too. But one of the things that he's getting at is that people that know Christ ought to have a personality in a matter of speaking that bubbles up and is a refreshing thing to others. What did Jesus say? He says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Is that what he's literally saying is going to happen? Or is it figurative? It's figurative. Okay, let's go a little further. John chapter 10. Notice verse number 7. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now notice this. I am the door of the sheep. What is he saying? Did he transform himself into an actual portal no. that could be open, closed, locked, whatever, opened, and so forth? No. What is he saying? He's saying that he is the way to enter into that sheepfold. Here, there's another thing I want us to think about as well. Uh, here he says, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, verse number 9. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Who are the sheep that he's talking about? And what kind of sheep is he talking about? Is he actually talking about the four-legged woolly critters? No. What is he talking about? He's talking about his followers, right? So when we, we, he's, he's speaking of us as sheep, okay? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, okay? That passage of scripture in Psalm 23 is a wonderful illustration of, of Christ's shepherding care for his sheep. And we're not talking about the four-legged woolly kind. What are we talking about? We're talking about us, human beings, okay? But it's figurative language. Notice verse number 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Again, that's figurative language. The sheep are what? Who are the sheep? Believers. Believers. Okay. Now, again, it's, it's all figurative language. Let's go to chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse 23 says, The hours come, Jesus answered them, saying, The hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Notice verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat shall fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Go back to verse 24. What is that corn of wheat that he's talking about? Is it an actual seed, or does it mean something? It means something, okay? He's talking about his laying his life down, okay? He didn't become a piece of wheat or a piece of grain, that's going to be dropped in the soil to grow again, okay? That's not what he's talking about. He, he is referring in figurative language of, his, of his, his death, his undoubtedly his burial, his resurrection, and so forth. It's, again, figurative language. Let's go a little further. John uh, 15. <clears throat> John 15 and verse number 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine. What did he mean? Did he actually transform himself into a vine? No, he didn't. He's using figurative language. And my father is the husbandman. Look at verse 4. He says, abide in me and I in you as the branch. Okay, he's calling us branches now. Okay, what are we? We're all twigs stuck to the vine 
Is that what he's saying? Is that what he, he, he expects of us to understand? He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. How many of you have ever produced an orange or a pear or a, you know, a whatever kind of fruit that you happen to like? None of us have. But we also understand that as I am connected to Christ and his life flows through me, what is produced in my life, what comes out of my life, we call it fruit. We call it the fruit of the spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. Okay, All of those things are a product of our being in the vine as branches. All of those things... Now go back to Matthew 26. All of that is figurative language, okay? So how are we to, um, to understand then <clears throat> Matthew 26, verses 26 and tw through 28? Because the Catholic Church says Jesus was speaking literally, was he also being spoken of literally by John when John said, Behold the Lamb of God? Did, did John actually see a four-legged woolly creature called a lamb walking down to the banks of the Jordan River to be baptized by him? Obviously not. Okay, Was Jesus actually, when he said, I am the vine, did he actually transform himself transform his substance into that of a vine obviously not when he talks of his believers as being sheep does he transform their substance into four-legged woolly creatures that go bah! obviously not so <clears throat> we have to understand when he says of the bread take eat this is my body that it's what? What is it? It's a representation. Okay? It's symbolic. Okay? Just like the, the cup and the wine so forth uh, is the same thing. Now, <clears throat> let's look a little further. Any questions real quickly about that? I know I threw a bunch of stuff at you real quick. Okay? Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, look at verse, <clears throat> Luke 12, no, that's not right. Actually, let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's skip that. 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul, in this passage, recounts, as he mentions in verse 23, he says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three, 23, that the Lord Jesus, the same night at which he was betrayed, we just read that out of Matthew 26, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Okay, now notice the closing phrase of verse 24. He says, this do in remembrance of me. Why did the Lord institute the Lord's Supper? What's the purpose behind it? It's, it's to be, he is to be remembered, okay? We can go on. <clears throat> it says, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, verse 26, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So why was the, why was the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist, if you want to call it that, why was it instituted? What's the purpose behind it? It's to a memorial 
of what Jesus did. His broken body, his poured out blood. That was a memorial, okay? But the Catholic Church says that actually becomes the very body and blood of Christ. Okay, now answer this question for me. What does that sound like? <clears throat> okay, it, it sounds a little odd, doesn't it? Um, now, we, we know that um, our present president, he may have had an uncle that was eaten by cannibals, but that's not been verified. There, they do have, there are, can, have been cannibals. I don't know that there are any cannibals now, uh, but that's what it kind of sounds like, doesn't it? And again, I'm not trying to make fun of them, but what we have to understand is when Jesus said, take eat, this is my body. What is he saying? Is it literal or is it figurative? It has to be figurative because he was there. Now, uh, transubstantiation, interestingly enough, that particular doctrine um, did not become settled doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church until the 13th century, 1215 A.D., or A.D. 1215, okay? So it, it did not, it was not something that the church, the first century church, and for, you know, centuries later, uh, even believed, okay? When, when um, Christians came together, they would often celebrate the Lord's Supper as a memorial to remember the Lord's death, his sacrifice, till he come. And there's, again, there's a whole lot of theology wrapped up in that very simple observance, if you want to call it that, okay? There's a lot of theology in that. He says, um, <clears throat> this do in remembrance of me, and then he says, you do show the Lord's death till he come, okay? One of these days, what are we to understand from Paul's um, explanation in a matter of speaking in 1 Corinthians 11? He's coming again, okay? He promised that. And, and every time we come together and, and celebrate um, communion, the Lord's Supper, what are we remembering? We're remembering his death his burial, his resurrection, everything tied to why did he have to die? He died to save his people from their sin. Those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we become his sheep, right? And as, as we um, continue living in the vine, as it were, letting um, uh, you know, the Lord, in a matter of speaking, flow through us, what comes out of our life as we're, com as, as we're obedient to the Holy Spirit and the leaving, leading of the Lord? What comes out of our life? We become fruitful, right? And it's all figurative language. So it is in Matthew 26 when he says, take eat, this is my body. It doesn't literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It is a memorial of his death. And we remember it till he come. Any questions, comments, real quickly? <clears throat> yes. I was Jonathan. I don't remember ever all the time. Eight years I went to church with him. I never did any. I, I didn't do that because they drink out of the chalice and everybody sure. and St. <clears throat> Mary's or yep. Church Town or anywhere. They got a bunch of people. They sure. drink it after all those people. <laughs> Right. They wipe the outside of the cup only. Right. But when they make that, when he takes it out of that chamber, because there's a certain chamber it can only be in, up on the altar. The chamber. Yeah, the the I don't know. Oh, anyway, they take it out and they mix it. They mix, like, what I would say, wine. Oh, and it looks wine. like water. Mm -hmm. And then they <clears> put <throat> it in the chalice and they shake it around. And he yeah. does he does his thing, and then he drinks right. out of it first, right. Right. and then he holds it up, la 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 la. So right. I forget the song, and um, then they 
Um, but you can't eat an hour before you oh. take this. <clears throat> okay, that's I'm interesting. I'm interested in that. I never okay. did know. <laughs> I'll have to I'll ha I'll have to search that out. I'm not I never heard that. Never heard. Is that it. like going swimming or something? No, well, uh, yeah. yeah. If that's a shot family yeah. thing, because they are it's extremists. Extreme. Right. I mean, it, it could have been yeah. I don't know. I never heard that. I I know I had a a, a a friend of mine. He lived just up the street from me when I was growing up. Uh, his family was very devoutly Catholic. They never missed mass and that kind of thing. And he became an altar boy. He was, he was yeah. And <clears throat> I remember uh, my friend Bobby telling me, he said, boy, he said, I really, I, my, my mom wanted me to be an altar boy. And he said, I didn't want to because, you know, you got to go to these classes and different stuff and, you know, all, all this other stuff. Learn how to do what you're supposed to do and that kind of thing. And he said, then... I found out there was wine involved. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he's like 12, 13, 14 years old, right? And, and um, he said he came to me the first time he went out as an altar boy. And, and I could tell there was a little something wrong with him because his speech was a little slurred and he was walking a little sideways. But um, I said, well, how'd it go? And he goes, man, it was great. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, do you know? He said, after we give out the, you know, the, the, the mass and the Eucharist and this, and he's explaining all this to me, he said, you know, they can't just pour it down the sink. Right, right. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, that's the blood of Jesus. <laughs> I said, really? I said, so what happens? He said, we get to drink it. And I said, so how much? He said, I'm not sure, but there was an awful big bottle. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, you know. Um, yeah, I don't think I, as far as I remember, I never did that. I never went up to get any, anything because I told him he was crazy. But and I said, I'm not doing that. I said, you're going to catch some right. seeds. Sure. Well, I, I was, interestingly enough, I was uh, cha not channel surfing, but I was, I was internet surfing recently, and I came upon a guy, and I don't remember what's, what town or city or state he's in. He pastors a Baptist church, an independent fundamental Baptist church, okay? And in their paper, in his local area, and on TV, there was this announcement from the Jehovah's Witnesses. And what they were going to do on this particular Sunday, the, the, uh, the community is welcome. They are going to celebrate or commemorate the Lord's death. So he thought, well, that's interesting. You know, it was after church, and he and his wife went. And the minute, and now he was not in a suit and tie. He was not, you know, dressed in, you know, his frock coat and stuff like that. He was nicely dressed, but um, so forth. And, and they walked in, and, and they were met, met by some people from the church and greeters and different things. And, and they tried to slip in the back, sit on the back row, because this was, again, a Jehovah's Witness church, Okay. Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. We tried to get in there, and the guy said, oh, no, come this way. We have a place for you. And they put him right up front in the second row behind the, the church leadership. Okay? The pastor went on, and they were going to commemorate and celebrate and remember the Lord's death. And he got to explaining what they were going to do. And the pastor is talking to his wife, you know, very uh, quietly and so forth like that. And he goes, we're going to have communion. They're going to have communion. She goes, I'm not doing it. Well, the gentleman that was preparing everybody for this says, if you know you're on your way to heaven, please partake of the elements. And... The wafers, the bread came to the first row of leaders in the Jehovah's Witness Church, and they all passed it. They never took any of it. He got to us, and his wife is going, "I'm not taking that." And he goes, "You're taking that because we're going to we're, 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 we are. Do you know you're going to heaven?" That's what he just said. He just said, "If you know you're going to heaven, you can take of communion." And he said, "And I know I'm going to heaven, so we're doing it." She's like, I'm not doing it. He's like, okay, you know, Ephesians 5.25, you know, be submissive and that kind of thing. She did and, and that kind of thing. And, and he said, I happened to, 
to kind of peak that all went to the back of the of the church and came up and he said there was not another piece as far as i could tell of the the bread missing from that plate he said they brought the the little cups of, of grape juice you know like we do and that kind of thing it went past the leadership they never took they came to us he took one he gave it to his wife she goes i'm not doing that he goes yes you are so she took it, and, and he said, we were the only two people in that church that took communion. Why is that? Because it was prefaced with this statement. If you know you're going to heaven, feel free to partake of communion. They don't know. Then I don't know why would they ever have communion? Why? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's, it's, it's apparently all ritual for them. But it was interesting to me that we, you know, we had talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses and here's this video and that kind of thing. And, and, and you have to also understand this, folks. These, these groups really want, they really want to know where they're going. But they cannot be, they, they have absolutely no assurance. That, right. that they're going to go to heaven. None whatsoever. That's one, well, it is very sad. That's one of the reasons why it makes it more important for us as God's sheep, Christ's sheep, the ones that are connected to the vine, producing that fruit, to pray for them, compassionately present the gospel. And, and on top of that, I would say, very importantly, live our lives in such a way that that what we're offering, what we're presenting is desirable to them. Because too often, you've heard it uh, probably as well, maybe you know people like this. You know, if they're going to that church, I'm not, I'm not going to that church. Because those folks just, they're, if they're supposed to be Christians, they don't live it Monday through Saturday. And that's certainly not the kind of hypocrisy that we should be presenting to the world. Any other questions, comments real quickly? Oh, sure. They are dedicated. They are to be commended for their dedication. Most definitely. Sorry. Why don't you sure. Just... Sure. They don't know that it's just by faith. They don't right. need all that, just like I was. I sure. Blinded. Sure. So he said he was blinded. And he wasn't allowed to Absolutely. ask anything. Absolutely. He didn't ask his dad, no question. Sure. Yeah. So sure. Just... Well, let's have a word of prayer real quickly. And... Um, We'll look at our prayer sheets. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity. We pray that you would just work in our, our lives, Lord. And as we come in contact with uh, Catholics, we do pray that you would help us to remember these truths, not just as, a, again, an academic exercise, but uh, as, as an opportunity, Lord, to present what your word has to say. We do know and we will find out that for centuries the Roman Catholic Church has done what it could to prevent its followers from reading your word. And it, it thrives on illiteracy. They don't know what your word says. And we would pray that you would help us to show them for your honor and your glory. We pray your blessings on these prayer requests now in Jesus' name. Amen.